Hi, Dr. Dave here. Recently, I was invited to be a featured guest on a podcast with the famous astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. The full audio and video podcast, along with supporting resource links, can be found in the video description. This was my second appearance with Neil. The previous podcast dealt with the physics of billiards. The new podcast deals with the physics, technology, and strategy of bowling. In this video, I share excerpts from the podcast supplemented by illustrations and video demonstrations of things being discussed. I also provide some interesting pool analogy examples throughout. Enjoy! This is Star Talk Sports Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist and sports enthusiast. So, Gary, what do you have in store for us today? Dr. Dave, the pool hustler, ah. is now going, he's going to return today as Dr. Dave, Lord of the Lanes. He has some serious chops. He's bowled a perfect game. He, has, he still has an average over 200. Dave, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks, Neil. It's great to be back. In your misspent childhood, how did bowling become part of this as well? Well, my early life dream was to be the Dr. Dave of bowling instead of the Dr. Dave of fool. Because <laughs> I, really? I basically grew up in a bowling alley. My mom worked at a bowling alley, and luckily that bowling alley also had a pool hall in it, so it was just, it was just bliss, heavenly bliss for me, even as a child. Maybe you're good at, at bowling because you played for free, not because you actually studied the equations. Now, fess up. Are you telling me I got a free him? ride, Neil? You telling me I got a free <laughs> ride, man? <laughs> Confess your privileges here, right? That's what you got to do. I don't think ten pin bowling was initially started knowing that you'd oil the lane. What happens if you don't oil the lane? Yeah, the oil originally was to protect the wood, to treat the wood, mm -hmm. and also to limit friction. All right, because if you if you had a totally dry wood surface. Well, you and, end up with a big rut in the yeah, middle of the lane. Exactly. Yeah. And in the early days, people threw the ball straight, just like in billiards. One day, somebody put a piece of leather on the end of the tip, and then they were able to put spin, and a whole new world of shots opened up. Same thing with bowling. Somebody one day said, oh, what if I spin the ball? It's going to slide through the oil and then curve. Does that help me? They didn't know at first, but through experience, they learned it helps a lot. If there were no oil, you would not be able to throw a curve ball. Right. Because it would curve too soon. It would curve right away. Go right in the gutter. Every time you see these guys approach um, the lane, they have like this cloth and they're, it, they're, they're, they're like polishing their ball, which I had no idea why they did that. But so they're removing the oil? Bingo. They're removing the oil. You want, you want that ball knew. to generate as much friction as possible. You also want your throw to be consistent. So you don't want to have oil on it and have the oil build up over time. You want to get rid of that oil. Man. I just thought they really liked those balls. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, that guy is proud of that bowling ball. <laughs> Look at him. He's just like, yeah, baby, it's okay. Daddy's got you, baby. Daddy's got you. <laughs> and they want to they want to shine it up so they can see their pretty face in the reflection too. Huh? <laughs> Euler is a, a famous British mathematician from a century gone by, that you somehow invoke Euler equations to bowl a 300? That well, is I don't, awesome. honestly, I don't use the math when I bowl, but the math does affect the physics on the lane. Euler did many things, but one thing he contributed to dynamics is the Euler's equations of motion that describe gyroscopic effects. And these new bowling balls take advantage of these gyroscopic effects. So if you had a homogeneous ball, a solid sphere, and you spin it, it's going to spin on the same circumference the whole way down the lane. A stripe of oil is going to build up on that ball, and that would reduce the friction when it hits the dry part because it's spinning on this oil. A masse shot in billiards is the same as a curveball in, in bowling. Remember the masse shot, Chuck? Yes, you said whenever you hit one of those, you like to call it the I must say, I'm a say shot because when I because when I hit it, I must say you I'm owe me fifty dollars. Remember? <laughs> that? I'm say. That's it. You've got a weight block inside. So how is that then impacting how the ball does its thing? These weight blocks, it's asymmetric. This asymmetry is what enables the gyroscopic effects. All right, and the asymmetry comes from the shape of this core. It also comes from what angle do they drill the holes of your ball. It also comes from what angle do you spin the ball about as you throw it. So the ball is spinning about some axis. The ball has this asymmetry. Friction is acting on the ball. It causes the ball to do this gyroscopic precession or wobble or oscillating rotation, whatever you want to call it. 
And so that, that's, that creates what's called track flare. The oil doesn't build up on a circumference. The oil creates these tracks that are flared out and separated. And when you get your ball back after you throw it, you can actually see these oil patterns on the ball. Now, these bowling technologies, like the weight block they put in the ball that allows it to get this gyroscopic effect that prevents the oil from building up on one stripe, and the materials used for the cover stock or outer layer of the ball have been improved over years. The new materials increase friction and reduce how easily the oil builds up on the ball surface, enhancing the ability to curve the ball. When that technology came out, the bowling averages in leagues and the number of 300s per year increased dramatically. Any good bowler throws a curve ball. I always wondered why the ball curved more in the last spot. It breaks hard. Yeah, bowlers call that the back end. You want to have Ooh. a strong back end where Ooh. it curves hard and, and creates a good entry angle into the pins. Let's talk about the pin numbering briefly because I'm going to refer to them at times. So the pins mm -hmm. are in a triangle pattern. The head pin, the, the one in front, is called the one pin. Mm, but then, that is then they're numbered. so, so surprising. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, then the number, this is surprising too. The next row is two and three. Then it goes four, five, six. <laughs> Then it goes seven, eight, nine, ten. How does a bowler give themselves the best chance of getting a strike? You might think, throw it right down the middle and hit that head pin right in the center. But this can leave a dreaded split, which is very difficult to convert for a spare. You want it to hit off center slightly. That's how you can get a strike. But the problem is when it comes in straight, the ball deflects off the pins a little too much and it doesn't have enough power to drive through the center. And you often leave what's called the five pin, the one in the middle. Or sometimes you'll leave a, a 10 pin on the, on the far corner because the ball's not coming in strong enough to send the other pins toward the 10. Most bowling shots, you have three phases. You have the slide phase, where it's, just sl it's spinning like mad, but sliding through the oil, very little friction. It's curving just a slight amount. Then you have the, uh, the curve phase, where the friction is really grabbing and it's changing the direction of the ball. And during that curve phase, it's actually losing that, the side spin. And it, when it's done with the curve phase, it's actually mostly rolling. Mostly rolling in a straight line at the desired angle at the end. So it has very little uh, excess spin left over when it's sitting the I pins. I forgot that. Of course, yeah. if you're spinning it and it's responding to that spin by friction, it's slowing down that spin. Of course, that's going to happen. They want to come in at an exact six degree entry angle. All right, this isn't random. Wow. There's been, there's been extensive testing, extensive testing, lots of simulations. Chuck, that was my problem. I was angle. coming in at seven degrees the whole yeah, time. And, and I was five and a half. <laughs> well, Neil, 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 that's your problem, man. That's your problem. Seven <laughs> oh, degrees is man. not six. Oh, it's not six. Oh, oh my gosh. Now, you might think a, a bigger angle is better. Like, you might think, if I can get seven, isn't that better than six? Well, at, at some point, it's coming into the, into the pins a little too steep, and it just kind of kind of tunnels through and doesn't, doesn't spread them as well. It sounds like a small angle, but you have to curve it a fair amount because it's only curving in that last part of the lane, and the lane is really long and skinny. So to get an angle, you have to curve it significantly. And, and is that the pocket that you always hear them talk about? Bingo. For a right-hander, it's called yeah. the 1-3 one, the one pocket, and it's also called the Manhattan side. You don't want to go on the Brooklyn side. That's kind of embarrassing to a good bowler. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh. the term came from, you know, people in Manhattan, they have to cross over the bridge to get to Brooklyn. All right. All right. So, so if now you cross over... If you cross the over gutter? the head pin, you're hitting the left side. That means you weren't very accurate. You're hitting a, on the Brooklyn side, we call it. So is the gutter the Jersey side? What's, no! the, what's, what's up? What's up? Chuck, Tell the truth. Chuck, what's, what's going Chuck. on? So what, what if I just get brute force and ignorance to start bowling and just barrel one down there? You bring up a good point because that entry angle is critical. But the other critical thing is momentum. You know, the weight of the ball and the speed of the ball both contribute to the pin action. If you can throw a heavier ball faster, it's going to help. Assuming you can get that angle, which is harder. The faster you throw it, the more difficult it is to curve it enough to get that angle. Top pros, they can, they can spin the ball almost 10 revolutions a second. It's a pretty fast spin. Yeah. So you want to spin them as much as you can so you can throw it as fast as you can and still get that six degree entry angle. That's the, that's the secret sauce of bowling. Could you just give us a little more details about why is there oil there and how you have come to exploit that fact? Computerized machine puts the oil down uh, in certain patterns, and it's not always the same pattern. They put most of the oil at the, at the, in the first two thirds of the lane. The last third is mostly dry. It has a little bit of oil. That's where most of the curve occurs in the last third of the lane. 
But if the ball is picking up oil the whole way down the lane, it's going to slide more during that curve section. Typically in a league situation, they, they give us a fairly easy pattern. An easy pattern is where most of the oil is in the middle, and then the oil doesn't go down the lane as far. All right, that's the optimal situation. And one reason is if you're right-handed and you throw it more to the right, it hits the drier part of the lane sooner, and that lets it curve sooner, and you can still get a strike. You throw it too far to the left, it stays in the oil and doesn't, and doesn't curve as much, and you can still get a strike. And that's how you optimize your chances to get a strike. You mm -hmm. have strategy based on how the oil's put down. The pattern of oil that's been laid down in the lane isn't fixed. Is it kind of like a major cheat code? Once I learn how to read, read the oil movement as balls go down it and then distribute oil in different places on the lane? Well, there's three things there, Gary. One is you have to know what the pattern of oil is. In pro tournaments, they actually put down a different pattern on each of the two lanes that they're bowling on just to make it more challenging. Sometimes they use a totally different ball and sometimes they stand in a totally different place and throw it with a totally different speed and direction on each of those two lanes. That's the ultimate challenge. But again, in a league, they're putting down pretty much the same pattern for us every week. And, you know, I've learned to find the optimal way to throw the ball to give myself the best chance of getting a high score. How many balls are you able to use if you're playing like a real tournament game? There's no limits on the number of balls you can use. Most league bowlers, they have their, their strike ball, their curve ball, and they have a spare ball. Spare ball is usually made out of a hard plastic that has very little friction, very smooth surface. The beauty of that is you can throw it your normal way that you throw a strike shot, which is your most consistent throw. And it's spinning like like heck, but it just goes straight. It just doesn't go. Uh, yes, doesn't you can curve. aim straight at the pin curve. to get that right. spare. Right. Yes. First, you have to know what the pattern of the oil is that they're putting down. Mm -hmm. Then you have to know how does that pattern change uh, over time as you throw balls, because the ball is picking up oil when it's yeah. going down that slick part of the lane. So you're actually removing a little oil from the first part of the lane, and then that it's carrying that oil down. So as the night goes on, as the games go on, the oil is getting pushed down the lane. And it's getting pushed in the area that, that your ball's curving. All right, so it tends to give you less curve as the night goes on in that area. So a good bowler has to adjust based on the reaction of the ball. So when the ball is starting to come in light, we say, it's, it's not curving as much, we would typically move our feet to the left and aim a little bit to the left. That way we're hitting fresh oil and we're hitting fresh dry lane down, down the last third of the lane. So, so you, you've got to have a lot of experience to be able to read the oil patterns on the lane and, and then have the knowledge to know what will happen. How many practice throws do you get to throw? Cause that's not fair. You're starting a competition and you don't know what the terrain is. You know, even in the league, they give us five or 10 minutes of practice. And that whole time I'm hunting around, I'm hunting around, adjusting my speed, adjusting my spin, adjusting my aim point to try to find that optimal place to throw the ball. Yeah, so that is critical in practice. You have to identify that. A good player has to also realize, did that ball react like it did because I threw it a little bit too fast? Or because did I, did I get a little extra finger in it and spin it a little bit too much? But a good player is aware of all that. So to bowl a 300, you have to roll 12 consecutive strikes. Is exactly. That How rare is a 300? Uh, well, even league bowlers like myself bowl 300s every once in a while. Uh, this, this past weekend, I bowled uh, a 279. I that's didn't ask about a 270. I said 300. That's not a 300. <laughs> I'm you know. no, 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 don't play that game. Yeah. I'm letting you know how hard it is. I had one shot where I threw it what I thought was perfect. Yeah. And I had what's called a ringing 10 pin. The 10 pin is the one in the corner. And, it and the pin in front of that is the six pin. And if the entry angle isn't exactly perfect, and you don't hit it in exactly the right place, that six pin just wraps around the 10. Sometimes it touches it, and the 10 pin just ringing in place. It's just wild. It's ringing wobbling. in place. And that was the only mistake. Uh, so how many perfect games have you bowled in your life? Only one. But I've wow, had many. Wow. I've had many two I didn't ask you about the other games. Okay. No. <laughs> I know. That's like saying, that's like, Chuck, how many standing ovations have you had? <laughs> well, one time four people in the back stood up. But then I saw that they were just going to a concession stand. <laughs> Go back to the lane. Then you've got the arrows. They're used as guidelines. The arrows are about 15 feet down the lane, and that's what most bowlers use to aim. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, want to be, you don't want to be gazing down at your ball or gazing at the foul line. You want to be gazing at your distant target. So that's what most bowlers are looking at. They're trying to hit a certain board. You know, Between the arrows, there's boards. You can actually see the individual boards of the lane. There's uh, five boards per arrow, and there's seven arrows across the lane. Most bowlers are aiming at a particular board. The boards are about a one inch wide. 
And so good bowlers can can hit their target within about an inch, fairly fairly reliably. Pros are within an inch. You know, league bowlers like me, like me, we can get within two inches pretty reliably the whole night. We can hit our target within two inches. But if your speed is off a little bit, if you throw it a little too slow, it curves too soon and you don't get a strike. If you throw a little too fast, it curves too late. If you don't release your fingers the exact same way, you don't get the same amount of spin. So you don't get the same curve. So there's so many variables. I am almost developing a healthy respect for bowling. Well, thank you, Chuck, because I was I was uh, I was perceiving a very strong disrespect earlier. Yeah, I got to tell you the truth. <laughs> I didn't like him dissing my 279s. I think a lot of people suffer from this bias where because everyone can go bowling, people are under the impression that everyone can bowl. Yeah, you know, or bowl <laughs> well, or it's not as difficult as you just uh, let us see, which it seems like it's a game of true precision. But at the same time, this is the beauty of bowling and billiards. You can you can be terrible and still have a great time. That's what I love about bowling and pool. Anybody can enjoy it. That's yeah. a beautiful thought. I, I... Has anyone tried to sort of change the game? Technology has changed a little bit. These new balls that kind of revolutionize the game and increase the scores a lot. And technique has changed somewhat. Most bowlers had their fingertips in the ball and their thumb in the ball. But these two-handers now, they only put their fingertips in the ball. And when they release it, they can put way more spin on the ball. Two-handed throw is actually a fairly new thing. And it's, not, it's actually not widespread it yet. It is not new. Yeah. No, Chuck did it when he was a baby. Chuck I was going to tell you, that was invented by three-year-olds. Okay. okay. <laughs> Dr. Dave, it's great to have you back. And I'm, I'm afraid to ask you what else you are a world's expert in. So tell me your social media footprint. What, what do you have going there? So I have drdavebilliards.com. Uh, on Facebook, I'm Dr. Dave Billiards. On YouTube, I'm Dr. Dave Billiards. Okay. And the bowling videos, are those on YouTube? Oh, it's on a website I have. It's um, uh, videodemos.colostate.edu. Uh, always good to have you, Dave. We'll maybe try to find another way to get you back here. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up.